Story 5. The Elder. A year had gone by since I last saw the Wanderer, when at length a gentle knock on the door and a pleading voice announced the arrival of that devout brother to the hearty welcome which awaited him. Come in, dear brother. Let us thank God together for blessing your journey and bringing you back. The Wanderer. Praise and thanks be to the Father on high for his bounty in all things, which he orders as seems good to him, and always for the good of us wanderers and strangers in a strange land. Here am I, a sinner, who left you last year, again by the mercy of God, thought worthy to see and hear your joyful welcome. And, of course, you are waiting to hear from me a full account of the holy city of God, Jerusalem, for which my soul was longing and towards which my purpose was firmly set. But what we wish is not always carried out, and so it was in my case. And no wonder, for why should I, a wretched sinner, be thought fit to tread that holy ground on which the divine footsteps of our Lord Christ were printed? You remember, Father, that I left here last year with a deaf old man as a companion, and that I had a letter from a merchant of Irkutsk to his son at Odessa, asking him to send me to Jerusalem. Well, we got to Odessa all right in no very long time. My companion at once booked a passage on a ship for Constantinople and set off. I, for my part, set about finding the merchant's son by the address on the letter. I soon found his house, but there, to my surprise and sorrow, I learned that my benefactor was no longer alive. He had been dead and buried three weeks before, after a short illness. This made me very much cast down, but still I trusted in the power of God. The whole household was in mourning, and the widow, who was left with three small children, was in such distress that she wept all the time and several times a day would collapse in grief. Her sorrow was so great that it seemed as though she too would not live long. All the same, in the midst of all this, she met me kindly, though in such a state of affairs she could not send me to Jerusalem. But she asked me to stay with her for a fortnight or so until her father-in-law came to Odessa, as he had promised, to settle the affairs of the bereaved family. So I stayed. A week passed, a month, then another. But instead of coming too, the merchant wrote to say that his own affairs would not allow him to come, and advising that she should pay off the assistance and that all should go to him at Irkutsk at once. So a great bustle and fuss began, and as I saw they were no longer interested in me, I thanked them for their hospitality and said goodbye. Once more, I set off traveling about Russia. I thought and thought. Where was I to go now? In the end, I decided that first of all, I would go to Kiev, where I had not been for many years. So, I set off. Of course, I fretted at first, because I had not been able to carry out my wish to go to Jerusalem. But I reflected that even this had not happened without the providence of God, and I quieted myself with the hope that God the lover of men, would take the will for the deed and would not let my wretched journey be without edification and spiritual value. And so it turned out, for I came across the sort of people who showed me many things that I did not know, and for my salvation brought light to my dark soul. If that necessity had not sent me on this journey, I should not have met those spiritual benefactors of mine. So by day, I walked along with the prayer, and in the evening, when I halted for the night, I read my love to kindness, for the strengthening and stimulating of my soul in its struggle with the unseen enemies of salvation. On the road about forty-five miles from Odessa, I met with an astonishing thing. There was a long train of wagons loaded with goods. There were about thirty of them, and I overtook them. The foremost driver, being the leader, was walking beside his horse and the others were walking in a group some way from him. The road led past a pond which had a stream running through it, and in which the broken ice of the spring season was whirling about and piling up on the edges with a horrible noise. 
all of a sudden, the leading driver, a young man, stopped his horse, and the whole line of carts behind had to come to a standstill too. The other drivers came running up to him and saw that he had begun to undress. They asked him why he was undressing. He answered that he very much wanted to bathe in the pond. Some of the astonished drivers began to laugh at him, others to scold him, calling him mad, and the eldest there, his own brother, tried to stop him, giving him a push to make him drive on. The other defended himself and had not the least wish to do as he was told. Several of the young drivers started getting water out of the pond in the buckets with which they watered the horses, and for a joke, splashed it over the man who wanted to bathe, on his head or from behind, saying, There you are, we'll give you a bath. As soon as the water touched his body, he cried out, Ah, that's good, and sat down on the ground. They went on throwing water over him. Thereupon he soon lay down, and then and there quietly died. They were all in a great fright, having no idea why it had happened. The older ones bustled about, saying that the authorities ought to be told, while the rest came to the conclusion that it was his fate to meet this kind of death. I stayed with them for about an hour and then went on my way. About three and a half miles farther on, I saw a village on the high road, and as I came into it, I met an old priest walking along the street. I thought I would tell him about what I had just seen and find out what he thought about it. The priest took me into his house, and I told him the story and asked him to explain to me the cause of what had taken place. I can tell you nothing about it, dear brother, except perhaps this, that there are many wonderful things in nature which our minds can't understand. This, I think, is so ordered by God in order to show men the rule and providence of God in nature more clearly, through certain cases of unnatural and direct changes in its laws. It happens that I myself was once a witness of a similar case. Near our village there is a very deep and steep-sided ravine, not very wide, but some seventy feet or more in depth. It is quite frightening to look down to the gloomy bottom of it. A sort of footbridge has been built over it. A peasant in my parish, a family man, and very respectable, suddenly, for no reason, was taken with an irresistible desire to throw himself from this little bridge into that deep ravine. He fought against the idea and resisted the impulse for a whole week. In the end, he could hold himself back no further. He got up early, rushed off, and jumped into the abyss. They soon heard his groans, and with great difficulty pulled him out of the pit with his legs broken. When he was asked the reason for his fall, he answered that although he was now feeling a great deal of pain, yet he was calm in spirit that he had carried out the irresistible desire which had worried him so for a whole week, and that he had been ready to risk his life to gratify his wish. He was a whole year in the hospital getting better. I used to go to see him, and often saw the doctors who were round him. Like you, I wanted to hear from them the cause of the affair. With one voice, the doctors answered that it was frenzy. When I asked them for a scientific explanation of what that was, and what caused it to attack a man, I could get nothing more out of them, except that this was one of the secrets of nature which were not revealed to science. I, for my part, observed that if in such a mystery of nature a man were to turn to God in prayer and also to tell good people about it, then this ungovernable frenzy of theirs would not attain its purpose. Truly there is much to be met within human life of which we can have no clear understanding. While we were talking it was getting dark, and I stayed the night there. In the morning, the mayor sent his secretary to ask the priest to bury the dead man in the cemetery and to say that the doctors, after a post-mortem, had found no signs whatsoever of madness and gave a sudden stroke as the cause of death. Now at that, look at that now, said the priest to me, medical science can give no precise reason for his uncontrollable urge towards the water. And so I said goodbye to the priest and went on my way. After I had traveled for several days and was feeling rather done up, I came to a good-sized commercial town called Billa Tsirkva. 
As the evening was already coming on, I started to look around for a lodging for the night. In the market, I came across a man who looked as though he was a traveler too. He was making inquiries among the shops for the address of a certain person who lived in the place. When he saw me, he came up to me and said, You look as though you are a wanderer too. So let's go together and find a man by the name of Ivanov who lives in this town. He is a good Christian and keeps a splendid inn, and he welcomes wanderers. Look, I've got something written down about him. I gladly agreed, and so we soon found his house. Although the host himself was not at home, his wife, a nice old woman, received us very kindly and gave us an out-of-the-way private little garret in the attic to rest in. We settled down and rested for a while. Then our host came and asked us to have supper with them. During supper, we talked who we were and where we came from, and somehow or other, the talk came round to the question of why he was called Ivranov. I'll tell you an odd thing about that he said, and began his story. You see, it was like this. My father was a Jew. He was born at Shklov, and he hated Christians. From his very earliest years, he was preparing to be a rabbi and studied hard at all the Jewish chit-chat, which was meant to disprove Christianity. One day he happened to be going through a Christian cemetery. He saw a human skull, which must have been taken out of some grave that had been recently disturbed. It had both its jaws, and there were some horrible-looking teeth in them. In a fit of temper, he began to jeer at the skull. He spat at it, abused it, and spurned it with his foot. Not content with that, he picked it up and stuck it on a post, as they stick up the bones of animals to drive off greedy birds. After amusing himself in this way, he went home. The following night, he had scarcely fallen asleep, when suddenly an unknown man appeared to him and violently upbraided him, saying, How dare you to insult what is left of my poor bones? I am a Christian, but as for you, you are the enemy of Christ. The vision was repeated several times every night, and he got neither sleep nor rest. Then the same sight started flashing before his eyes during the daytime also, and he would hear the echo of that reproachful voice, as time went on, the vision got more frequent, and in the end, he began to feel depressed and frightened and to lose strength. He went to his rabbi, who read prayers and exorcisms over him, but the apparition not only did not cease, it got even more frequent and threatening. This state of affairs became known, and hearing about it, a business friend of his, a Christian, began to advise him to accept the Christian religion and to urge upon him that apart from that, there was no way of ridding himself of this disturbing apparition of his. But the Jew was undesirous to take this step. However, in reply, he said, I would gladly do as you wish if only I could be free from this tormenting and intolerable apparition. The Christian was glad to hear this and persuaded him to send into the local bishop a request for baptism and reception into the Christian church. The request was written, and the Jew, not very eagerly, signed it. And lo and behold, the very minute that the request was signed, the apparition came to an end and never troubled him again. His joy was unbounded, and entirely at rest in mind, he felt such a burning faith in Christ that he went straight away to the bishop, told him the whole story, and expressed a genuine desire to be christened. He eagerly and quickly learned the dogmas of the Christian faith, and after his baptism, he came to live in this town. Here he married my mother, a good Christian woman. He led a devout and very comfortable life, and he was most generous to the poor. He taught me to be the same, and before his death gave me his instructions about this, together with his blessing. There you are. That's why my name is Ivranov. I listened to this story with reverence and humility, and I thought to myself, how good and kind our Lord Christ is, and how great is his love, in what different ways he draws sinners to himself, with what wisdom he uses things of little importance to lead on to great things. Who could have expected that the mischievous pranks of a Jew with some dead bones would bring him to the true knowledge of Christ and be the means of leading him to a devout life? After supper, we thanked God and our host and retired to our garret. We did not want to go to bed yet, 
so we went on talking to each other. My companion told me that he was a merchant of Mogilev, and that he had spent two years in Bessarabia as a novice in one of the monasteries there, but only with a passport that expired at a fixed date. He was now on his way home to get the consent of the merchant community to his finally entering upon the monastic life. The monasteries there satisfy me. Their constitution and order, and the strict life of many devout starts who live there. He assured me that putting the Bessarabian monasteries besides the Russian was like comparing heaven with earth. He urged me to do the same. While we were talking about these things, they brought still a third lodger into our room. This was a non-commissioned officer with the army for the time being, but now going home on leave. We saw that he was tired out of his journey. We said our prayers together and lay down to sleep. We were up early the next morning and began to get ready for the road, and we only just wanted to go and thank our host, when suddenly we heard the bells ringing for matins. The merchant and I began to consider what we would do. How could we start after hearing the bells and without going to church? It would be better to stay to matins, say our prayers in church, and then we should go off more happily. So we decided, and we called the officer, but he said, What's the point of going to church while you are on a journey? What good is it to God if we have been? Let's get off home and then say our prayers. You two go if you want. I'm not going. By the time you have stood through matins, I shall be three or four miles or so farther on my way, and I want to get home as quickly as possible. To this the merchant said, Look here, brother, don't you run so far ahead with your schemes until you know what God's plans are. So we went to church, and he took the road. We stayed through matins, and the liturgy too. Then we went back to our garret to get our bags ready for our start, when what do we see but our hostess bringing in the samovar. Where are you off to, she says. You must have a cup of tea, yes, and have dinner with us too. We can't send you away hungry. So we stayed. We had not been sitting at the samovar for half an hour, when all of a sudden our non-commissioned officer comes running in, all out of breath. I've come to you in both sorrow and joy. What's all this? we asked him. This is what he said. When I left you and started off, I thought I would look in at the pub to get change for a note, and have a drink at the same time so as to get along better. So I did. I got my chance, had my drink, and was off like a bird. When I had gone about two miles, I had a mind to count the money the fellow at the pub had given me. I sat down by the roadside, took out my pocketbook, and went through it, all serene. Then suddenly it struck me that my passport was not there, only some papers and money. I was as frightened as if I'd lost my head. I saw in a flash what had happened. Of course, I had dropped it when I was settling up at the pub. I must run back. I ran and ran. Another awful idea seized me. Suppose it's not there. That will mean trouble. I rushed up to the man behind the bar and asked him. I've not seen it, he said, and was I downhearted. Well, I searched around and hunted everywhere, wherever I stood and hung about. And what do you think? I was lucky enough to find my passport. There it was, still folded up and lying on the floor among the straw and litter, all trampled in the dirt. Thank God. I was glad, I can tell you. It was as though a mountain had rolled off my shoulders. Of course it was filthy and coated with mud, enough to get me a clout on the head. Still, that doesn't matter. At any rate, I can get home and back again with a whole skin. But I came to tell you about it. And what's more, in my fright, I've rubbed my foot absolutely raw with running and I can't possibly walk. So I came to ask for some grease to bandage it up with. There you are, brother, the merchant began. That's because you wouldn't listen and come with us to church. You wanted to get a long way ahead of us, and, on the contrary, here you are back again, and lame into the bargain. I told you not to run so far ahead with your schemes, and now see how it has turned out. It was a small thing that you did not come to church, but besides that, you used such language as, What good does it do God if we pray? That, brother, was bad. Of course, God does not need our sinful prayers, 
But still, in his love for us, he likes us to pray. And it is not only that holy prayer which the Holy Spirit himself helps us to offer and arouses in us that is pleasing to him. For he asks that of us when he says, Abide in me, and I in you. But every intention, every impulse, even every thought which is directed to his glory and our own salvation, is of value in his sight. For all these the boundless loving kindness of God gives bountiful rewards. The love of God gives grace a thousandfold more than human actions deserve. If you give him the merest might, he will pay you back with gold. If you but purpose to go to the Father, he will come out to meet you. You say but a word, short and unfeeling, receive me, have mercy on me, and he falls on your neck and kisses you. That is what the love of the Heavenly Father is like towards us, unworthy as we are. And simply because of this love, he rejoices in every gesture we make towards salvation, however small. It looks like this to you. What glory is there for God? What advantage for you? If you pray a little, and then your thoughts wander again. Or if you do some small good deed, such as reading a prayer, making five or ten acts of reverence, or giving a genuine sigh and calling upon the name of Jesus, or attending to some good thought, or setting yourself to some spiritual reading, or abstaining from some food, or bearing an affront in silence. All that seems to you not enough for your full salvation and a fruitless thing to do. No, none of these small acts is in vain. It will be taken into account by the all-seeing eye of God and receive a hundredfold reward, not only in eternity, but in this life. St. John Chrysostom asserts this, no good of any sort, he says, however trifling it may be, will be scorned by the righteous judge. If sins are searched out in such detail that we shall give an answer for words and desires and thoughts, then so much the more good deeds, however small they are, will be taken into account in all detail and will be reckoned to our merit before our judge, who is full of love. I will tell you a case in which I saw myself last year. In the Bessa Arabian monastery where I lived, there was an elder, a monk of good life. One day a temptation beset him. He felt a great longing for some dried fish, and as it was impossible to get any in the monastery at that time, he was planning to go to the market and buy some. For a long while he struggled against the idea and reasoned with himself that a monk ought to be content with the ordinary food provided for the brothers and by all means to avoid self-indulgence. Moreover, to walk about the market among crowds of people was also for a monk a source of temptation and unseemly. In the end, the lies of the enemy got the upper hand of his reasoning, and he, yielding to his self-will, made up his mind and went for the fish. After he had left the building and was going along the street, he noticed that his rosary was not in his hand, and he began to think. How comes this, that I am going like a soldier without his sword? This is most unseemly. And lay folk who meet me will criticize me and fall into temptation, seeing a monk without his rosary. He was going back to get it, but, feeling in his pocket, he found it there. He pulled it out, crossed himself, and with his rosary in his hand went calmly on. As he got near the market, he saw a horse standing by a shop with a great cartload of enormous tubs. All at once, this horse, taking fright at something or other, bolted with all its might and with thundering hooves, made straight for him, grazing his shoulder and throwing him to the ground, though not hurting him very much. Then, a couple of paces from him, that load toppled over and the cart was smashed to splinters. Getting up quickly, Naturally, he was frightened enough, but at the same time, he marveled how God had saved his life, for if the load had fallen a split second earlier, then he would have been smashed to pieces like the cart. Thinking no further about it, he bought the fish, went back, ate it, said his prayers, and lay down to sleep. He slept lightly, and in his sleep, a benign-looking elder whom he did not know appeared to him and said, Listen. I am the protector of this dwelling, and I wish to teach you so that you will understand and remember the lesson now given you. Look now, 
the feeble effort you made against the feeling of pleasure, and your sloth in self-understanding and self-control gave the enemy his chance to attack you. He had got ready for you that fatal bombshell which exploded before your eyes, but your guardian angel foresaw this and put into your mind the thought of offering prayer and remembering your rosary. Since you listened to this suggestion, obeyed, and put it into action, it was just this that saved you from death. Do you see God's love for men and his bountiful reward of even a slight turning towards him? Saying this, the visionary elder quickly left the cell. The monk bowed down at his feet, and in doing so woke up to find himself not on his bed, but kneeling prostrate at the threshold of the door. He told the story of this vision for the spiritual benefit of many people, myself among them. Truly boundless is the love of God for us sinners. Is it not marvelous that so small an action, yes, just taking his rosary out of his pocket and carrying it in his hand and calling once upon the name of God, that that should give a man his life, and that in the scales of judgment upon men, one short moment of calling upon Christ should outweigh many hours of sloth. In truth, here is the repayment of the tiny mite with gold. Do you see, brother, how powerful prayer is and how mighty the name of Christ when we call upon it? St. John Karpathyski in Philokalia says that when in the prayer of Christ we call upon the holy name and say, Have mercy on me, a sinner. Then to every such petition the voice of God answers in secret, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And he goes on to say that when we say the prayer, there is at that moment nothing to distinguish us from the saints, confessors, and martyrs. For, as St. Chrysostom says, Prayer, although we are full of sin when we utter it, immediately cleanses us. God's loving kindness to us is great, yet we sinners are listless, are not willing to give even one small hour to God in thanksgiving and barter the time of prayer, which is more important than anything, for the bustle and cares of living, forgetting God and our duty. For that reason we often meet with misfortunes and calamities, yet even these the all-loving providence of God uses for our instruction and to turn our hearts to Him. When the merchant came to the end of his talk to the officer, I said to him, What comfort you have brought to my sinful soul too, your honor? I could bow down to your very feet. Hearing this, he began to speak to me. Ah, it seems you are a lover of religious stories. Wait a moment and I'll read you another like the one I have just told him. I've got here a book I travel with called Agapia, or The Salvation of Sinners. There are a lot of wonderful things in it. He took the book out of his pocket and started reading a most beautiful story about one agathonic a devout man who from his childhood had been taught by pious parents to say every single day before the icon of the Mother of God, the prayer which begins, Rejoice, God-bearing maiden. And this he always did. Later, when he had grown up and started life on his own, he got absorbed in the cares and fuss of life and said the prayer but rarely, and finally gave it up altogether. One day he gave a wanderer a lodging for the night, who told him he was a hermit from the Thebaid, and that he had seen a vision in which he was told to go to Agathonic and rebuke him for having given up the prayer to the Mother of God. Agathon said the reason was that he had said the prayer for many years without seeing any result whatever. Then the hermit said to him, Remember, blind and thankless one, how many times this prayer has helped you and saved you from disaster. Remember how in your youth you were wonderfully saved from drowning. Do you not recall that an epidemic of infectious disease carried off many of your friends to the grave, but you remained in health? Do you remember when you were driving with a friend, you both fell out of the cart, he broke his leg, but you were unhurt? Do you not know that a young man of your acquaintance, who used to be well and strong, is now lying weak and ill? whereas you are in good health and feel no pain. And he reminded Agathonic of many other things. In the end, he said, Know this, that all those troubles were warded off from you by the protection of the holiest mother of God, because of that short prayer, by which you lifted up your heart every day into union with God. Take care now, go on with it, 
and don't give up praising the Queen of Heaven, lest she should forsake you. When he had finished reading, they called us to dinner, and afterward, feeling our strength renewed, we thanked our host and took the road. We parted, and each went his own way, as seemed best to him. After that, I walked on for about five days, cheered by the memory of the stories I had heard from the good merchant in Bila Tsirkva, and I began to get near to Kiev. All at once, and for no reason at all, I began to feel dull and heavy, and my thoughts got gloomy and dispirited. The prayer went with difficulty, and a sort of indolence came over me. So, seeing a wood with thick undergrowth of bushes by the side of the road, I went into it to rest a bit, looking for some out-of-the-way place where I could sit under a bush and read my love to kindness, and so arouse my feeble spirit and comfort my faint-heartedness. I found a quiet place and began to read Cassian, the Roman, in the fourth part of Philokalia on the Eight Thoughts. When I had been reading happily for about an hour, quite unexpectedly, I noticed the figure of a man some hundred yards or so away from me and farther in the forest. He was kneeling quite motionless. I was glad to see this, for I gathered, of course, that he was praying, and I began to read again. I went on reading for an hour or more and then glanced up again. The man was still kneeling there and never stirred. All this moved me very much, and I thought, what devout servants of God there are. As I was turning it over in my mind, the man suddenly fell to the ground and lay still. This startled me, and as I had not seen his face, for he had been kneeling with his back to me, I felt curious to go and see who he was. When I got to him, I found him in a light sleep. He was a country lad, a young fellow of about twenty-five. He had an attractive face, good-looking, but pale. He was dressed in a peasant's caftan, with a bast rope for a girdle. There was nothing else to note about him. He had no bag, not even a stick. The sound of my approach awoke him, and he got up. I asked him who he was, and he told me he was a state peasant of the Smolensk government, and that he was on his way from Kiev. And where are you going to now? I asked. I don't know myself where God will lead me, he answered. Is it long since you left home? Yes, over four years. And where have you been living all that time? I have been going from shrine to shrine and to monasteries and churches. There was no point in staying at home. I'm an orphan, and I have no relations. Besides, I've got a lame foot, so I'm roaming about the wide world. Some God-fearing person, it seems, has taught you not just to roam anywhere, but to visit holy places, said I. Well, you see, he answered, having no father or mother, I used to go about as a boy with the shepherds of our village, and all went happily enough till I was ten years old. Then one day, when I had brought the flock home, I never noticed that the chief's very best sheep was not among them, and our chief was a bad and inhumane peasant. When he came home that evening and found that his sheep were lost, he rushed at me abusing and threatening. If I didn't go off and find the sheep, he swore he'd beat me to death, and I'll break your arms and legs, he said. Knowing how cruel he was, I went after the sheep searching the places where they had been feeding in daylight. I searched and searched for more than half the night, but there was not a trace of it anywhere. It was such a dark night, too, for it was getting on towards autumn. When I had got very deep into the forest, and in our government the forests are endless, suddenly a storm got up. It was as though the trees were all rocking. In the distance, wolves started howling. Such a terror fell upon me that my hair stood on end. What's more, it all got more and more horrible, so that I was ready to drop with fear and horror. Then I fell on my knees and crossed myself, and with all heart I said, Lord Christ, have mercy on me. As soon as I had said that, I felt absolutely at peace, straight away, as if I had never been in any distress at all. All fear left me, and I felt as happy in my heart as if I had flown away to heaven. This made me very glad, and well, I just didn't stop saying the prayer. To this day, I don't know whether the storm lasted long and how the night went. I looked up, and daylight was coming, and there was I, still kneeling in the same place. 
I got up quietly, I saw I shouldn't find the sheep, and home I went. But all was well in my heart, and I was saying the prayer to my heart's content. As soon as I got to the village, the chief saw I hadn't brought the sheep back, and thrashed me till I was half dead. He put his foot out of joint, you see. I was laid up, almost unable to move, for six weeks after that beating. All I knew was that I was saying the prayer, and it comforted me. When I got a bit better, I began to wander about in the world, and as to be continually jostling about in a crowd didn't interest me, and meant a good deal of sin. I took to roaming from one holy place to another, and in the forest too. That's how I have spent nearly five years now. When I heard this, my heart was very glad that God had thought me fit to meet so good a man, and I asked him, How do you often use the prayer now? I couldn't exist without it, he answered. Why, if I only just call to mind how I felt that first time in the forest, it's just as if someone pushed me down on my knees and I began to pray. I don't know whether my sinful prayer is pleasing to God or not, for as I pray, Sometimes I feel a great happiness. Why? I don't know. A lightness of spirit. A happy sort of quiet. But at other times, I feel a dull heaviness and lowness of spirits. But for all that, I want to go on praying, always, till I die. Don't be distressed, dear brother. Everything is pleasing to God, and for our salvation. Everything, whatever it is that happens in time of prayer. So the Holy Fathers say, whether it's a lightness of heart or heaviness, it's all right. No prayer, good or bad, fails in God's sight. Lightness, warmth, and gladness show that God is rewarding and consoling us for the effort, while heaviness, darkness, and dryness mean that God is cleansing and strengthening the soul, and by this wholesome trial is saving it, preparing it in humility for the enjoyment of blessed happiness in the future. In proof of this, I will read you something that St. John Climax wrote. I found the passage and read it to him. He heard it through with care and enjoyed it, and he thanked me very much for it. And so we parted. He went off right into the depth of the forest, and I went back to the road. I went on my way, thanking God for treating me, sinner as I am, as fit to be given such teaching. The next day, by God's help, I came to Kiev. The first and main thing I wanted was to last a while and to make my confession and communion in that holy town. So I stopped near the saints, and that would be easier for getting to church. A good old Cossack took me in, and as he lived alone in his hut, I found peace and quiet there. At the end of a week in which I had been getting ready for my confession, the thought came to me that I would make it as detailed as I could, so I began to recall and go over all sins from youth onwards very fully. And so as not to forget it all, I wrote down everything I could remember in the utmost detail. I covered a large sheet of paper with it. I heard that at Kitavaya Pustina, about five miles from Kiev, there was a priest of ascetic life who was very wise and understanding. Whoever went to him for confession found an atmosphere of tender compassion, and came away with teaching for his salvation and ease of spirit. I was very glad to hear of this, and went to him at once. After I had asked his advice and we talked a while, I gave him my sheet of paper to see. He read it through and then said, Dear friend, a lot of this that you have written is quite futile. Listen, first don't bring into confession sins which you have already repented of and had forgiven. Don't go over them again for that would be to doubt the power of the sacrament of penance. Next, don't call to mind other people who have been connected with your sins. Judge yourself only. Thirdly, the Holy Fathers forbid us to mention all the circumstances of the sins and tell us to acknowledge them in general, so as to avoid temptation both for ourselves and for the priest. Fourthly, you have come to repent and you are not repenting of the fact that you can't repent. For example, your penitence is lukewarm and careless. Fifthly, you have gone over all these details, but the most important thing you have overlooked. You have not disclosed the gravest sins of all. You have not acknowledged nor written down that you don't love God, that you hate your neighbor, that you don't believe in God's word, 
and that you are filled with pride and ambition. A whole mass of evil and all our spiritual depravity is in these four sins. They are the chief roots out of which spring the shoots of all the sins into which we fall. I was very much surprised to hear this, and I said, Forgive me, Reverend Father, but how is it possible not to love God, our Creator, and persevere? What is there to believe in if not the Word of God, in which everything is true and holy? I wish well to all neighbors, and why should I hate them? I have nothing to be proud of, besides having numberless sins. I have nothing at all which is fit to be praised, and what should I with my poverty and ill health lust after? Of course, if I were an educated man, or rich, then no doubt I should be guilty of the things you spoke of. It's a pity, dear one, that you so little understood what I said. Look, it will teach you more quickly if I give you these notes. They are what I always use for my own confession. Read them through, and you will see clearly enough an exact proof of what I said to you just now. He gave me the notes, and I began to read them as follows. A confession which leads the inward man to humility, Turning my eyes carefully upon myself and watching the course of my inward state, I have verified by experience that I don't love God, that I have no love for my neighbors, that I have no religious belief, and that I am filled with pride and sensuality. All of this I actually find in myself as a result of a detailed examination of my feelings and conduct. Thus, 1. I don't love God. For if I loved God, I should be continually thinking about Him with genuine joy. Every thought of God would give me gladness and delight. On the contrary, I much more often and much more eagerly think about earthly things, and thinking about God is labor and dryness. If I loved God, then talking with Him in prayer would be my nourishment and delight, and would draw me to unbroken communion with Him. But, on the contrary, I not only find no delight in prayer, but even find it an effort. I struggle with reluctance. I am enfeebled by sloth, and am ready to occupy myself eagerly with any unimportant trifle, if only it shortens prayer and keeps me from it. My time slips away unnoticed in futile occupations. But when I am occupied with God, I put myself into His presence every hour. When I put myself into His presence, every hour seems like a year. If one person loves another, he thinks of him throughout the day without ceasing. He pictures him to himself. He cares for him. And, in all circumstances, his beloved friend is never out of his thoughts. But I, throughout the day, scarcely set aside even a single hour in which to sink deep down into meditation upon God, to inflame my heart with love of him while I eagerly give up twenty-three hours as fervent offerings to the idols of my passions. I am forward to talk about frivolous matters and things which degrade the spirit. That gives me pleasure, but in the consideration of God I am dry, bored, and lazy. Even if I am unwillingly drawn by others into spiritual conversation, I try to shift the subject quickly to one which pleases my desires, I am tirelessly curious about novelties, about civic affairs and political events. I eagerly seek the satisfaction of my love of knowledge in science and art, and in ways of getting things I want to possess. But the study of the law of God, the knowledge of God and of religion, make little impression on me and satisfy no hunger of my soul. I regard these things not only as a non-essential occupation for a Christian, but in a casual way as a sort of side issue with which I should perhaps occupy my spare time at odd moments. To put it shortly, if love for God is recognized by the keeping of his commandments, if ye love me, keep my commandments, says our Lord Christ, and I not only don't keep them, but even make little attempt to do so, then in absolute truth the conclusion follows that I don't love God. That is what Basil the Great says. The proof that a man does not love God and his Christ lies in the fact that he does not keep his commandments. 2. I don't love my neighbor either, for not only am I unable to make up my mind to lay down my life for his sake, according to the gospel, but I don't even sacrifice my happiness, well-being, and peace for the good of my neighbor. 
If I did love him as myself, as the gospel bids, his misfortunes would distress me also. His happiness would bring delight to me too. But, on the contrary, I listen to curious, unhappy stories about my neighbor, and I am not distressed. I remain quiet, undisturbed, or, what is still worse, I find a sort of pleasure in them. Bad conduct on the part of my brother, I don't cover up with love, but proclaim abroad with censure. His well-being, honor, and happiness don't delight me as my own, and, as if they were something quite alien to me, give me no feeling of gladness. What is more, they subtly arouse in me feelings of envy or contempt. 3. I have no religious belief, neither in immortality nor in the gospel. If I were firmly persuaded and believed without doubt that beyond the grave lies eternal life and recompense for the deeds of this life, I should be continually thinking of this. The very idea of immortality would terrify me, and I should lead this life as a foreigner who gets ready to enter his native land. On the contrary, I don't even think about eternity, and I regard the end of this life as the limit of my existence. The secret thought nestles within me. Who knows what happens at death? If I say I believe in immortality, then I am speaking about my mind only, and my heart is far removed from a firm conviction about it. That is openly witnessed to by my conduct and my constant care to satisfy the life of the senses. Where the holy gospel taken into my heart in faith as the word of God, I should be continually occupied with it. I should study it, find delight in it, and with deep devotion fix my attention upon it. Wisdom, mercy, love are hidden in it. It would lead me to happiness. I should find gladness in the study of the law of God, day and night. In it I should find nourishment like my daily bread, and my heart would be drawn to the keeping of its laws. Nothing on earth would be strong enough to turn me away from it. On the contrary, if now and again I read or hear the word of God, yet even so it is only from necessity or from a general love of knowledge, and approaching it without any very close attention, I find it dull and uninteresting. I usually come to the end of the reading without any profit, only too ready to change over to secular reading in which I take more pleasure and find new and interesting subjects. 4. I am full of pride and sensual self-love. All actions confirm this. Seeing something good in myself, I want to bring it into view or to pride myself upon it before other people or inwardly to admire myself for it. Although I display an outward humility, yet I ascribe it all to my own strength and regard myself as superior to others, or at least no worse than they. If I notice a fault in myself, I try to excuse it. I cover it up by saying, I am made like that, or I am not to blame. I get angry with those who don't treat me with respect and consider them unable to appreciate the value of people. I brag about my gifts, my failures in any undertaking, I regard as a personal insult. I murmur, and I find pleasure in the unhappiness of my enemies. If I strive after anything good, it is for the purpose of winning praise, or spiritual self-indulgence, or earthly consolation. In a word, I continually make an idol of myself and render it uninterrupted service, seeking in all things the pleasures of the senses and nourishment of my sensual passions and lusts. Going over all this, I see myself as proud, adulterous, unbelieving, without love to God, and hating my neighbor. What state could be more sinful? The condition of the spirits of darkness is better than mine. They, although they don't love God, hate men, and live upon pride, yet at least believe and tremble. But I? Can there be a doom more terrible than that which faces me? And what sentence of punishment will be more severe than that upon the careless and foolish life that I recognize in myself? On reading through this form of confession which the priest gave me, I was horrified and I thought to myself, Good heavens! What frightful sins there are hidden within me, and up to now I've never noticed them. The desire to be cleansed from them made me beg this great spiritual father to teach me how to know the causes of all these evils and how to cure them. And he began to instruct me.